Here's an opportunity now for you to add your voice and your views and interpretations of all of that information so that we can have a conversation with Brian, uh, Byron. Uh, so, comments, questions? It's your internet. Yep. This gentleman right here. Okay, thank you. Um, in all the online consultation, I mean, you, you've indicated that uh, users of the internet, all kinds of concerns. Did you sense through the consultation that they accepted that the self-governing nonprofit model was the right approach to solving these issues or addressing these issues? Well, obviously, I'd be a little. I mean, but can, can the alternative me? is the government should do yeah. this. Um, so obviously, I'm a little biased in that as somebody who runs a uh, not-for-profit corporation that operates a piece of the internet. Uh, but that bias disclosed. I think what uh, we have heard, generally speaking, is support for the multi-stakeholder model. So that general ecosystem of uh, a bottom-up, consensus-based uh, governance model. That said, you know, as we talked about earlier, there may be some scalability issues uh, over time. So because we have had that model for all time does not mean we must have the exact same thing for all time, and that's one of the conversation streams that we're trying to solicit is how is what is the best model how should we best be doing this um, but just to answer your question specifically we have definitely had good support for the multi stakeholder bottom up model and uh, few calls for a government owned operated internet over here on the right side lady Mike? Yeah. Yeah, okay. there you go. Sorry. My name is Wanda Hatko. Uh, I, I would like to address the issue of uh, security and digital education in terms of not the, from the point of uh, not the consumer like we consider so far, but the website owners, like small business website or develop, developers for small business website and how the quality of code for the website impacts the overall security of the internet. In my experience, I noticed there is a lot of technical issues with the coding of the many websites, especially small business and the community websites. There is no validation for the code many so basically my my, my 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 kind of question would be how this quality of implementation of the websites impacts the overall security of the internet thank you well that's that's a good question that's um, typically a little outside of our frame in terms of our day-to-day -day. however what i will say is when we look at the major bots and secure um, security threats that we deal with which are really around the large uh, botnets. Uh, most of those are, co are just simply compromised computers and websites where um, there is control of a given computer as a result of a given computer having some sort of malicious uh, software on them that allows it to be controlled. And that's where you see the botnets emanating from. Um, so being educated and, digital and having digital some sense of digital literacy, I think, is absolutely critical in that commercial interaction, both from the buyer, the one who's trying to have a website created, and, and without a doubt, the seller, the creator of it. Um, but really there, it's, I would say it's buyer beware in terms of, uh, in terms of code quality, um, and also making sure that whatever your site is, is up to date in terms of all antivirus and security software. You know, it's, Unfortunately, what we see over and over and over again is it's really easy to cheap out on having the appropriate security software installed. And it's always kind of that last thing, oh, I don't need that antivirus, I'll, I'll run unprotected for a while, I'm sure I'll be fine. But the problem is you're not. And it's absolutely critical, this goes back to digital literacy and understanding, that people do protect themselves appropriately. Um, so I think it's incumbent, and again, we talked about rights and responsibilities online, I think it's the responsibility of website 
owners and website creators to make sure that you're appropriately protected. And quality of code, well, uh, I have lots of coders in my shop and it's a fine art, so I'll leave that up to them. Which I would also like to um, just mention, this is not just to be a dialogue for me with individuals in the crowd. I mean, if people want to engage with each other, please feel free or have expertise to bring to bear on a given question like that. Okay. There was another question just in that area right there. Raise your hand again. Oh, and we have a question at the front here. And I have an online question, and I'll be over here. Hi, my name's Heather Duncan. Um, this isn't a question, it's a comment. I'm a certified financial planner. And my comment has to do with uh, digital literacy and older people. And uh, I only once saw one comment about an older person or, or speaking about older people on the screen. And my concern is I have, uh, I have a lot of older clients in my base. It's not, my concern isn't so much the digital literacy for older people getting them online. What I'm seeing is when they start forgetting their passwords and um, get confused and just, I'm gonna call it the natural aging process that happens maybe mid 80s on. Um, my concern is elder abuse and in families and financial elder abuse. So mom and dad um, forget their password or find it all too confusing. And we don't know now who's transacting for them online and whether they even have the pop proper power of attorney in place. So my concern for financial literacy and the older people is who steps in because in some ways it bypasses the legal power of attorney. Thank you. We have, we have an online question from John. What is Sarah's view of proposed Bill C-30? We knew someone was gonna ask. <laughs> well, that's not loaded at all. <laughs> uh, given that most of my board members are here today, I, I'll probably start with Sarah doesn't have a view on C-30. <laughs> <laughs> However, I think uh, the internet community certainly has an expressed a view, and as Byron, I will express my own view but I want to make sure I distinguish those two. Uh, I think that C30, you know, and again, it goes back to I thought it was a good dialogue with Frederick from the Sauté this morning and, and Michael Geis in particular, and Steve from Open Media. How do you find that right balance? There's no doubt that technology is changing at a pace that legislators are having trouble keeping up with. Um, and legislators are having difficulty with trying to protect industries, like I'm just going to call it the copyright industry, with trying to balance that against the benefits of the technology and the internet industry. So how do you find that appropriate balance? You can't just throw the copyright industry out the window. On the other hand, the copyright industry may have to look at itself and say, do we need to fine tune these models? What happened in C30, I think, is it was far too heavy handed in terms of the surveillance piece online. And that's, when I go back to that notion of the internet being an enabling technology that stretches across all industries now. So you can't just legislate for the benefit of a particular vertical. And that's one of the real challenges that all legislators, it's not just, it's not this government per se, this is around the world, right? I mean, as I said, people are marching in the streets in Poland on these issues. The, how, the Congress in the US just rolled over on this issue. It is a tough one to find the right balance on. Current government took a shot at it, um, and, and I, I would argue um, we need to continue to work to fine tune that balance. We're not quite there yet. There's a comment here in the center. Could you raise your hand, please? Yep, and Mike's coming to you, and I see you at the back next. I will just add, though, that that goes back to being educated about having um, uh, both rights and responsibilities. And it is our responsibility to, to speak out, and I think that's what you saw. So people are getting more educated on these issues. And, and to be fair to the government, the government was listening too, right? I mean, they've taken it back and uh, taken it off, off the agenda, and we'll see where they go forward. And I'm sure whatever gets 
put forward at some time in the future will be quite different than what we saw this go around. Your point. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you uh, and your team for putting on a fabulous day and a great presentation of the top of mind issues. Thank uh, you. The issue I had planned to address is a bottom of the mind issue similar to what the lady previously had and that is death on the internet. Uh, and, um, and I'm not talking about the, uh, you know, people influencing other people to suicide because I consider that a, a crime thing. But uh, people forgetting that they have virtual assets, people have PayPal accounts, uh, people have uh, points um, that they have credited on loyalty uh, things. They have rights to website addresses and people forget to put that into their wills or there's differences between family wishes and uh, providers in terms of their policy. Uh, there's no control. I've heard stories about people going in who were not related to people who died, closing their Facebook account, and then when the families finally realized it, before they could get it memorized, the account has already been wiped out or disappeared. So the issue of people have to uh, have some policies, and I don't know whether that falls under uh, digital literacy or uh, uh, as a security issue or other thing, but it's something that people will have to uh, address and take into consideration. The same with the uh, financial literacy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I have to admit, I, um, I agree, and I, I think that goes back to digital literacy, and it's back to the passwords. I don't, I don't think, I'm sure everybody in here, you don't have to be 80 to have forgotten a password. I know, I know I've forgotten one or two. I'm still trying to get in. Um, but really, I think those issues do go back to digital literacy and understanding um, in the virtual world, like in the physical world, that people wrote wills, they kept records and kept track of it in a meaningful way. Well, we still have to do all of that stuff in the virtual world. Okay. Gentleman at the back, just right of center, right at the Thank you. Hi, my name is George Elsaig, and uh, I have a question about IPv6. Is it, when is it going to be implemented in Canada, and uh, is it going to affect the privacy, especially that you have uh, IPs, that many IPs that can be assigned to many devices, so it might be implemented on every device? Thank you. Uh, in, in terms of IPv6, I mean, there are many actors in the Internet ecosystem who have to enable IPv6. Uh, we are one of those actors, but if you think of, uh, think of it as a supply chain from your browser down to the corporate website or, or, or uh, social media tool you want to use, there are many people along that supply chain or many entities, and you, they really, in a sense, have to all be enabled. Uh, th and that includes the gear makers, too, the, the Cisco's of the world, as well as the telcos and the transit providers. All of us have to do it, and all of us are doing it at different rates. As far as CIRA is concerned, we were IPv6 ready and up and running for IPv6 day last June. So we, as an entity in our part of the ecosystem, are ready to go. Um, but if you're trying to find IPv6 service in the Canadian landscape right now, uh, you would be somewhat limited. So it's a process. This is not a, and the other thing I'd like to, to just state, this is not a cutover, right? IPv4 to 6 is not, we're starting over here at 4 and we're going over there to 6, right? They're going to run uh, in parallel for a very, very long time. And the process of getting everybody up to speed on IPv6 is going to take some time as well. Um, you can get it, you just have to, you have a lot fewer providers to, to access it from but both on the registrar when you're getting a domain name uh, from us at the registry level and from your ISP. It is accessible, but right now it's still pretty spotty. There was another gentleman at the same table. Now come, I have to go online and one here. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Andre. I'm 23 years old. And uh, I heard a lot of talk of today about security and protecting sort of the government and the private sector networks and even individual privacy but I haven't heard much about individual security. And by that, I mean it's something that I didn't really think about addressing uh, until it happened to a friend of mine, and it's something called you know, cyberbullying. And it's an issue that um, 
you know, my generation and those younger than me have to deal with now that really older individuals in this room probably didn't have to. And I'm just wondering how we go about protecting individuals because uh, these days anyone can post anything online uh, that's detrimental to somebody's future and given the digital footprint and the amount of people that see it, it can have a tremendous impact in their career. So, so how do we sort of increase the security for individuals from being attacked by others via this mode of communication? Well, that, uh, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, and I have, uh, I have a number of kids from 8 to 18, so it's certainly something that uh, speaks to me, and I don't see the bullying piece per se with my own kids, but I'm certainly very aware of it. Uh, I think it, it's one of those issues, and I hate to keep lumping things in digital literacy, but in a sense, that just proves the point of how critical becoming digitally literate is. And I'm wondering, is Jane, from Media Awareness Network, still in the room, for chance? Or anybody from Media Jane, Awareness Jane Network? Jane Tallon? Okay, I just thought that might be a good person to uh, have speak to an issue like that. Just, it's a little outside the registry business, per se. But I absolutely agree, and I think that that's where, you know, he just once again highlights the importance of uh, providing programs and support around becoming digitally literate from grade school on up. And, and as we said earlier, it's not you finish school and stop doing that. That's a lifelong learning process to remain digitally literate. I'll go to an online question from David. Does Sarah have an opinion on the proposed takedown of the internet by Anonymous at the end of March? <laughs> yeah, that'd be bad. <laughs> uh, and not to, make, not to make too light of it, um, Anonymous is serious. And uh, they have certainly engaged in some naughty behavior already. And uh, we do take it seriously. But as far as what we're doing, no, I'm not going to talk about that. This lady in the, I think it's pink. <laughs> it's hard to tell with the lights. Oh, I understand that. Hi, uh, Kim from TechMag Social. Um, I noticed that one of the survey responses, or well, I guess a few people responded that the uh, internet should be a right, internet access should be a right. However, by definition, um, something's not a right unless there is a legal remedy to ensure that if that right's violated, that, uh, that things are corrected. Did anyone offer up, unprompted, what they think this remedy should be? Like if you cannot afford um, internet access, would it be free internet? If you can't afford a computer, would it be a free computer? Or if you are geographically inaccessible, what does that entail? Or if there are any of you have a comment yeah. about that too. Right? I mean, specific question is, did you see in your survey anything that addressed those? Uh, not particular. Uh, which is a very good question. There weren't any solutions per se uh, provided in the survey itself. Uh, you know, it's a very, that is a very interesting question and you know, we have seen other countries, uh, particularly like other Western countries, Western Demo with Western democratic traditions, um, uh, create the right to internet access. It's fairly recent, we'll see how that goes. Uh, Finland, for one, is an example, and I mean, they have a sparsely populated, often dark stretch of rock and trees, not dissimilar to our own, in a sense. Um, and, and they've made it a right, so it will be interesting to see how that plays out. But it doesn't specifically address your technical legal question, and I'm not a lawyer. Does any, are there any lawyers in the room? Internet lawyers in the room? Anybody wants to wade into that <laughs> one? <laughs> we have a gentleman okay. at the very back just left the center. If you'd stand, sir, it makes it easier for the mic runners to find you. It was on when you turned it off. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Nonokov, and I have a question that's uh, more in your wheelhouse, being the uh, domain register, uh, registry for Canada. Um, given that the internet forum has uh, surfaced a lot of questions around security, have you guys any plans to speed up signing the, uh, the route for .ca, um, but rather than the 2012 target on the website with 2013, excuse me, 2013 for the secondary zones? 
Is Jacques in the room? Jacques, I can see you there. Jacques is our, uh, leads the technology group, both uh, dev and operations at CIRA, and is deeply immersed in this very subject. So I'll let you go straight to the horse's mouth, so to speak. Hello, hello. So for uh, DNSSEC, right now we're developing the solution and we should be, we should be able to sign .ca in April, May timeframe. Uh, at that point, we're going to have limited ability to, if you want to sign your domain, we can do ad hoc. And then full registry by midsummer toward within 2012. We, by 2013, 100% should be DNSSEC. Okay, straightforward answer there. Any other points of view, comments or questions? Over here, up right, uh, towards the back. If you could stand, ma'am. There you go. Hi again, Marita Mull from Telecommunities Canada. I don't think the issue of digital literacy is going to go away anytime soon, but I do have to say that there, there is an excellent deeply ingrained, implanted digital literacy program going on in Canada, and it's been going on for 15 years. Uh, these are, uh, this is the work of more than 3,000 community centers, community access groups across the country who work in their communities with seniors, with youth, with indigenous peoples, providing literacy programs day and night. Uh, the problem is that these it's difficult for these groups to get very much recognition. And I don't know really what CIRA can do about this, but I mean, I guess just kind of putting it up there, putting it on the map, helping to provide some recognition that this program is out there, it's something we ought to be extremely proud of. I don't know who else has this. It's an outgrowth of the um, Community Access Project that started in 1994. But it's there, it's still up and running and, and really, really vibrant and proud. I just came from a conference where 300 of these people were meeting and showing off their, their best programs. So, uh, I mean, I think sometimes here, maybe everywhere, we kind of ignore what we already have <laughs> and uh, instead, of, instead of really recognizing it and building on it. So I'm hoping that Sarah can, that whether there's some role for Sarah there, I don't know. Thanks very much for the comment. Thank uh, you. I mean, I think that's great news. And I think it's not that we forget about it, but like, like uh, almost any message, we need to continue to say it over and over. And, and our, you know, I think one of our fundamental roles, obviously we run a registry and we run the DNS. That's what we do. But we also have this other role to create an environment where people can come together and communicate those messages. And that's what this forum is about. And now you have uh, 300 plus other folks in the room have heard that message again as well as all the folks online. So uh, I think we are going to, you know, our goal here is to try to help get those kinds of messages out and create that space where it can happen. Thank you. Hello, my name is Karen Breek and I'm a physician. So I spend a lot of time trying to address healthcare literacy online and one of the biggest things I've learned quite right away is to teach people to go to .cas versus .coms for reasons I think will be fairly obvious to most of this crowd. What my question is, although we've talked about the importance of literacy, it, it's a crime to take one dollar out of your bank account, but it doesn't seem to be a crime or with any oversight to put up a website, including a .ca website, to say you're a physician when you're not, and say that you have a cure for disease when you don't, um, and that there's no other forum you could have this basically um, total buyer beware advertising that is taking advantage of very vulnerable people in vulnerable times that is hurting people to the point of actually killing people in some cases because they're taking wrong advice and taking things that are hurting them. What, if any, thing can Canada do to take a leadership role in helping set higher standards or recourse, or addressing the health literacy issues specific to healthcare websites. Thank you. Uh, I think that's a I think that's a great question. I would maybe back out of specific to healthcare for a moment and say, you know, if I'm if I'm a quack selling snake oil, I can go do that on a street corner and put up a shingle and claim to be whatever I want anywhere in Ottawa here right now. 
the laws that apply to that still apply to an online world in a domestic environment. The, the real difference is, to, me, to my mind, listening to that question, is the network effect. If I'm a quack with a shingle somewhere in Ottawa, how many people can I impact? If I'm a quack with a website on the internet, I suddenly have the network effect and I can impact all kinds of people. And um, you know, the fact that it's, in a, in a sense, in a printed environment often conveys some sort of sense of legitimacy when, like we all know, um, just because you read it doesn't make it true in, any, in the printed word as well. Which is really just saying, you know, the challenge here is no different than what you'd find in the, in the physical world. It's just now you have the network effect, which is in a sense an exponential uh, effect of that problem. But the folks who are doing that are still bound by the same rules and regulations that the, the physical quack on the street with a shingle is. It's just a question of getting to them. And, uh, you know, we do, for various reasons, you know, we do... Uh, we do shut down websites if they're wildly false and misleading. I mean, we have a process for that type of thing. And certainly law enforcement is also going to do the same types of things there as they would do in the, in the physical world. Any other points of view? Just waiting on one more web question coming in. Gentleman towards the center, back here. Sir, if you'd stand, it makes it easier for them to find you. There you go. Thank you. My name is William Calls. I'd just like to follow up on the, que on the comment the lady made about uh, code standards. As a small business operator, we had a website and we were in, t I'm, I, I, I'm a programmer, but I have no knowledge of HTML or creating websites or anything like that. I'm entirely dependent on the quality of the person I hire and on the person who hosts my site to create a secure and safe website but there is no good way of knowing whether either of those people really know what they're doing. In the end, again, it's a buyer beware situation. Thank you. I, I agree with you, and, and to, you know, often I try to put the metaphor back into the physical world. Um, you know, if you're getting body work done on your car, that can be a shady business. How many people really know what good body work looks or feels like, right? I mean, you have to go and investigate who you're working with, is it a trusted source, does it have a good reputation, and do your due diligence. Because there's lots of great, great web developers and designers and shops out there, uh, but there are certainly some that aren't so great. And it is a buyer where you need to be educated. But there's, I mean, there's great shops right here in town doing good work. We, have, we work with a whole bunch of them, uh, but you have to be aware, absolutely. I'm going to an online question. I'll be right with you, sir. What can be done to double, triple the number of responses on the online Canadian Internet Forum website next time from Dan? Well, I would like to flip that around and ask Dan what he thinks. <laughs> and the audience. Um, I can tell you it's not for lack of trying and trying to build the online component of this event. And ironically, of course, it's an online consultation. And one of the biggest challenges is to get people to participate online. We have more people physically in the room than we do uh, online. So I'd be very curious to hear what can we do? As we reach out to the various communities, be they academic or technical or marketing or social media. I mean, we specifically reach out and, and create awareness about this. Um, but I'd love to hear ideas on how we can better get people engaged uh, in the online world. Looking for suggestions. A gentleman here on the left side. Yeah, Stephen Stewart. I'm, I'm a programmer. I'll speak to the the question of code quality on websites. There's no such thing as verifiable logic in a programming language. You can't guarantee that there's not going to be bugs. There's no language that allows you to do that. Uh, the solution is to have testers as well as programmers. But the biggest problem of web security isn't bad code quality. It's uh, things that are difficult to police from here. Um, industrial espionage is not a crime in Asia, and it's big business in China. Uh, uh, three quarters of the botnets in the world are controlled by programmers in Russia, and possibly other areas close to there. 
um, they're not going to go away soon, and it's impossible to police them from here. Okay. Thank you. There was another comment, just this gentleman here. Come back. The, the one thing I would just say on that, uh, just to give people a sense of context too, is, um, and you can go see it on uh, McAfee's website. So McAfee uh, provides antivirus and security software of various stripes. And they do at least an annual, if not semi-annual, review of, of um, safe environments uh, geographically by top-level domain. So, so .ca, anything to the right of the dot is a top-level domain, essentially. So the comms, nets, orgs on the, in the generic space, and then the country codes like .ca. And you can go see the map. It's sort of a green to red map, a graded map of secure and safe environments, which is measured effectively as uh, malicious or um, well basically malicious code or compromised computers for the total number of domains, roughly speaking. And you can see the green countries that are safe, that have relatively low penetration rates in terms of botnets or compromised computers to the, to the high ones. And, and you know, obviously this is a little bit self-promoting, but .ca is one of the most secure environments. And to the point, to the gentleman's point, you know, there are other environments which are bright red, lots of compromised computers, you find you don't have uh, much penetration in terms of antivirus software, there's lots of copyright infringement. Um, you know, where you see pirated software is where you typically see no security or antivirus software, which is where you see compromised software. And that's where a lot of the botnet and really malicious activity is coming out of. The good news is .ca's, while not perfect, is certainly one of the safest environments. Gentleman right here. Yes, um, Marcel No, I work as, as a uh, trademark lawyer in Montreal. Uh, but I also have an interest in uh, Enterprise 2.0 uh, uh, principles, so maybe to pick up on what you said about what can be done regarding um, the participation, willingness to participate online. Um, I was a bit surprised to see in the uh, top of mind uh, um, issues that the, uh, the sense of belonging to community or the sense of citizenship was not there. Um, there's a book called uh, that was written by uh, Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone. Um, he's a professor in Harvard in social policy and he, he wasn't sure when, when he looked at uh, um, what happened to, uh, to the, the social capital in the last decades that new technology were actually bringing people together. Maybe uh, it just created distance instead of bringing people together. So I think it's good that you have a meeting uh, in-person uh, meeting, but probably if you if you need or m if you want more people to participate online, um, it, it's difficult. But you, you cannot create a community with online. You have the, the community has to exist, and the online tools has to support what the community is doing. And actually, Mark Zuckerberg said that to bankers in Switzerland, where he said. Uh, uh, one of one of the uh, the bankers said, "Oh, wow! Now he will he, he will help us uh, build communities with uh, with his Facebook thing." And his, his short answer was, "No, you can't. The community has to exist, and, and the, the tools are there to support it. So building co community is very very hard, but it has to be done." Thank you. And here in the very front again, please. And I saw a hand go up just back there somewhere. We'll so be there in just a sec. Thank you. Uh, it's Kim again. Um, all day I've been seeing this huge ambiguity in a term, I've been using this term all day, it's digital, liter ah, digital literacy. And am I the only one who's seeing this as two separate but interrelated terms where digital literacy seems to be a munging together of technical skills, you know, how to use, I don't know, how to use the internet, how to, which buttons to poke to get to the cloud, whatever. And online social literacy, gee, who's a scam artist, when shouldn't I respond? Am I the only one seeing that? That we really need two definitions here? Maybe put them under the same umbrella of digital literacy, but we really need to clarify those. Any thoughts on that? 
Well, I think that was one of the things that actually did come out in the survey is people making comment that we need to have a commonality of terminology and that that term is one that is being overused and it, the breadth of the way people are using it is probably too wide. So I think that, that actually did come out specifically in the survey. Okay. Do you want to define it right now and we'll go with that? <laughs> I, it's a very, very valid point. What, what does it mean? Okay, so two definitions and word for room for clarification as we move forward. Absolutely. There was a question. Okay, great. Is that a mic? If you stand up, ma'am, we're good. Um, hi, I have three things to suggest. Um, I'm a former website designer, and um, one of the things I looked in the beginning to find out who were fake websites was simply something very simple. Uh, it's the who is registry. It's where you look up is this person even real? Do they have, they don't have a phone number? I don't buy from them, it's very simple. A lot of websites now, it's common, you know, we just use email addresses, we don't even have phone numbers anymore. But it's something that I used as a tool to sort of help me identify if this person was legit or not. Um, the second thing I wanted to say was in terms of getting more participation, um, by identifying your questions and thinking about, again, the tribes of people, people are, many different tribes all the time. Um, you can look on blogs and you can start um, looking for, I, I think blogs and um, university students uh, are a good way to sort of see how you can promote it more, um, aside from using Facebook as a tool. And the last thing I wanted to say was in your survey, um, did anybody come across the, the subject of overwhelm? Like when you go onto the internet now, you have a lot more choice than you did even five, six years ago. So whether that's through information or through uh, technology, business, anything you basically do online, um, you know, there is that sort of underlying feeling of overwhelm and I think it needs to be addressed because it, it will affect either, you know, other sectors like health, um, you know, education, just how, how people operate. And um, I just see it as a concern that is sort of subtle, but there, and needs to be sort of addressed in terms of how to manage it without making it feel like you're being managed. So that's sort of what I wanted to put out to you. Thank you for those three points. Did you want to address that last one? Yeah, well, I think the last one is interesting. Uh, you know, there is a whole notion of body of research in, in uh, consumer capitalist-based countries around choice and products. I mean, it's kind of separate from what you're talking about, but there's a whole body of research around the more choice you have at a certain point, there's a tipping point, and then the more choice you have, uh, the less able you are to actually make a decision. And you can see this in research because you have the wall of soup cans, you go stand in front of it and you stare blinkingly into it and you just walk away without a can of soup. And in a sense, it's a very different uh, metaphor, but you know, I, I definitely see that happening. And back to the healthcare issue, you know, that's one of the challenges. You do a Google search on something related to healthcare and I hate to say it, most of the time I do it, you seem to come up with less than useful information and often highly suspect information. So I think it is, it is one of those issues that's going to be getting more and more uh, important over time. On the right side. Imagine I, when we put that next exabyte of information on the internet. And just to uh, touch base on what she was mentioning as well with the who is searches. Um, we're in the CIRA forum right now. We're uh, dealing with .ca's and a lot of .ca's are not actually showing the who is information if you do a yeah, search on it because of privacy issues particularly if it's a private, or, yeah, a private person or a private organization. Could you hold the mic closer, please? We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I was just saying that a lot of the .ca is due to privacy if you do a search on a who is a domain in Canada. If that domain is held by a private individual, uh, the who is information is not public knowledge. So that particular search uh, option isn't really going to do, uh, do much good. Yeah, and, and just so that everybody understands what we're talking about here, there's a particular uh, function or application that we have called Who Is, which has been a feature of the internet for a long time, not just for Sierra. And that allows you to type in a, a URL or web address um, 
the domain name, and it will tell you who is behind who is behind that, and it will give you some specific information uh, behind that, including. Um, in the past, a, a contact name, an admin contact name, and some general contact details. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, due to the fact that privacy legislation in Canada changed in the early 2000s, we had to change uh, our policy on that. And for private domain registration, or domain registrations uh, for an individual, we mask that data so you can't access the person behind a given domain name. Now, th there was a whole other debate at that time around what's the appropriate balance of privacy versus transparency. So for corporate or organizational domain names, company domain names, all of that information is still available. But for individual registered domain names, their personal information is masked. And that's uh, something we put into effect in uh, is Mike here, June 2010. So it's been a couple of, couple of years. I'm going to go. There's a gentleman by the door at the back, and then at the front, and we have an online. Good, sir, could you stand just to help him find you? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Marcel Mason. I'm with the Inuit Tapri Canada Me, which is the national organization representing Inuit in Canada. I noticed on the survey that the order of concern was that security, digital literacy, and access or speed, which from an urban standpoint makes sense. You have something, you want to protect it, you want to learn how to use it effectively. The, and the majority of Canadians you know, live in an urban environment with good access. So I'm wondering, how we ensure that the minority of Canadians to whom reasonable access is a major concern, and that's a, a huge chunk of Northerners, uh, manages to stay somewhat close to the top. And secondly, how CIRA may see itself playing a role in bridging the access divide. I think our role in th on that particular issue is to help foster and create awareness, to, to bring those issues forward in environments like today where we have policy makers in this room who deal with those issues. So, you know, what you just said is heard by policy makers who are working on uh, access issues. On the other hand, we're simply, you know, this is not meant to be a cop out. We're reporting on what Canadians told us. So the fact that one issue floats above the other is a result of, statistically speaking, those were the responses that we heard. Uh, but I think you also have to remember, access, cost, and speed were still the third highest running issue. It, it's not like those issues have uh, suddenly gone underground and people aren't thinking about them. They're, those are still top of mind issues it's just security is now the higher runner right now. And maybe if you did it today, as opposed to in the fall, you'd hear copyright issues were, were, were the key issues. But I think access is still top of mind um, in, the, in the policymakers' world. And um, certainly speed and price are ever present. I mean, it's only months ago we had CRT de CRTC decisions on, on some of these very issues. So the, I think there's still high runner issues and um, while you continue to have to make your voice heard on those, I don't think the access issue is going away anytime soon. But thank you for your comments and it's important that those are the kind of comments that we need to hear in environments like this. This gentleman right here. And I got you here. Um, I'm, uh, to, to come back to the digital literacy question and how it sort of pertains to uh, what Sierra is doing and how this forum kind of can, can impact change. Um, I was doing a session with uh, a, a small local group called Citizens for Safe Cycling on Saturday. And it sort of as an analogy, uh, we were talking in that, uh, that group about how we could get uh, drivers to be more aware of cyclists, how we could get dooring to be less of an issue, all those types of things, right? And uh, the first thing that people started saying was, well, we got to go out and do education campaigns, we got to get uh, awareness of the issue and all this other stuff. 
And when it came right back to it, we were a very small organization with very limited resources. And there's a very limited amount we can do in terms of educating every single driver. So I think the problem with the digital literacy question is that the mandate of CIRA uh, has very much to do with what you were talking about with making sure .ca is reliable, making sure it's secure, and making sure Canadians have a safe place to go on the internet, right? So that's, that's your mandate. Digital literacy is out here, right? And it's so huge. So I, I guess the question then is, um, what goals then, in terms of improving digital literacy, what specific things can CIRA do to help improve parts of digital literacy that will make Canadians' on lives better? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I want to just rephrase the first part of your, of your question, which is what does CIRA actually do? Well, CIRA runs a registry in the DNS. That's what we do. Everything we do beyond that is a little bit outside our wheelhouse. Now, we do have this other corporate object about doing other good things for the Canadian internet landscape, and that's where we come to the digital literacy question. Um, we, uh, in spite of what some people think, are also a small organization. We're 60 people, and we run all this infrastructure for all, for, for all Canadians. Um, our focus is technical and engineering and development and, and all of that stuff. So what we do is, is, what I think we can really do is we provide an expert-based, in a sense, agnostic. We don't come with a policy prescription, right, or an ideology. Our only ideology is what's best for the health of the Internet. That's what we bring. And we bring this safe, secure space, physically, the CIF, where all kinds of people, different points of view, can come. And to me, the fact is, the, no, the, the, the fact that you are here means inherently, almost by definition, you're a digital leader and thinker, because you're taking the time out of your day to come and talk about internet governance, which, as I said, is a somewhat esoteric subject for most people. So part of it is, you know, you need to go back and be that ambassador, or that emissary for these digital issues, which, um, you know, really have a profound impact on all of our lives. And you, sort, you see it a little bit with SOPA, right? The, it's coming out, C30 Act. Uh, people are starting to feel how important it is and get more educated and literate. We could never have done around C30 what ended up happening, right? That movement that came together. But what we can do as CIRA is provide the unbiased, non-ideological, technical uh, uh, expertise viewpoint. And I think that's what we can really do to offer value to the community in becoming um, uh, uh, digitally literate overall. That's what I see. I mean, of course, I'm one voice in CIRA. Um, I have a particular role in CIRA, so sometimes my voice gets heard. But, um, you know, that, that's what I see that we can do is really be a forum and bring expert, independent, unbiased, non-ideologically driven input into... Uh, forum environments. We have that convening power because we don't bring a bias to the table. And I think that's what we can do best with our limited resources. Thank you. I'm going to take an online question and then there's one here and then we'll take a break. But right after the break, we're coming back into more open dialogue so we won't miss anything. So the online question from Rod is, does CIRA have any plans to acquire additional GTLDs in the future or is .ca the end game? CIRA does not have any plans at this time to acquire other TLDs. I thought that was a short answer. <laughs> Pardon? What is a GL GTLD? Ah, that is an excellent question. Sorry. Like I said, we are an acronym-heavy industry. So uh, a GTLD is a generic top-level domain. There's two types of top-level domains. That's to the right of the dot. There are country code top-level domains, which are CC TLDs. And they're like us, .ca, every country has one, .uk, .fr for France, et cetera. Those are CCTLDs, or country code top level domains. And the generics are the ones you would know, like .com, net, or biz, info. Typically uh, uh, profit driven or, or corporately owned entities, with the exception, of course, of .org. Okay, and no plans at the moment. So, and if I could just go, if I could just touch on that, I, I think the reason the question was asked 
is uh, we are, we as in the internet community writ large are in the process of adding a whole bunch of new generic top level domains. So right now the process is ongoing for those who would like to apply to acquire a new uh, generic top level domain. So there'll be many different types, geographic or community based. So if you think dot NHL or dot Toronto or dot music or dot eco, I mean those are all the kinds of possibilities that people will be coming up and applying for literally as we speak. Okay, thank you. And your Thank you. And Nicole McGill here. Um, I wanted to address uh, the question that you put out to people in terms of how you can get more involvement on your survey. Um, I am not a CIRA member, but I'm interested in becoming now, one now. And you first came on my radar with last year's Canadian Internet Forum. That's how I, I stumbled upon you in, uh, in, in social media. And I'm trying to get a sense of what the what role is the forum vis-a-vis -vis the survey? Because to me, both should be feeding one another. Um, everybody that's here should have a survey um, to, to fill out because as you pointed out, we all are digital leaders here and we're all interested. We've taken a day off to talk about internet governance. So you already have um, your community here. You have your leaders here. Um, and I'm wondering why I didn't get an email to, uh, to fill out the survey because I had registered last year. So like I'm, a, I'm one of your um, ambassadors or a future ambassador. So, so that's what I would, I would put out to you in terms of uh, maybe there needs to be more integration between the two. I don't know, but I think your, your hub is right here. And when did, I might did I mention that there's no free drink at the end until you fill out the survey? <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah. I was just going to say my very next remark if, is if that I you could will just, all, uh, I'm just going to jump in on that one. That's a great suggestion. And if we miss that one, next year we're going to fix that. And uh, that means all of you are going to have to fill out that survey then. So okay. that's a great, it's a great point and it's, it's something we'll add to the hopper for next year. Right. So Julie just came and talked to me a few minutes ago, Byron, and and said just to let you all know that immediately after this event you are all receiving an email with a link to a survey. <laughs> and, and, and I knew that before your question, I promise, okay? But that is true, remember that, you will receive an email with a link to a survey to find out about your experience today and what needs to happen next and, the, and to extend and continue this dialogue. But your overall comments and links are appreciated as well. Thank you very much. So we've heard a lot of very interesting information today and what impresses me the most and impacts me the most of what I hear is there are still so many more points of view to be heard, so many opinions. We, um, you know, we heard about things on the survey, but then you yourselves are telling us, well, we should have heard more things from more people, and yet you here today are also adding uh, totally new points of view, requests for clarification, ideas on what else could be done, uh, specific types of uh, concerns in healthcare that apply even on a broader domain. That's why there is a Canadian Internet Forum to make sure that we uh, capture those ideas today. And as we said at the beginning, we've, you know, we're sending this out in webcast and capturing it. We've got a whole panel of people back there working on things, rapporteurs in the room. Uh, so this conversation is being noted, there's no doubt about that. We're going to take a short 15 minute break. I think it's certainly time for that again. We're going to bring you back in 15 more minutes. And you've been asking us questions and now it's our time to ask you. We really want your opinion. Where do we go from here? Okay, what's next for internet, for the uh, governance of the internet? What's next for CIRA? So in 15 minutes, please come back and tell us your point of view on that. Thank you, see you in 15 minutes. Thank you the multi-stakeholder internet governance model is the reason why the internet has been able to succeed. It works. It works because the people and organizations that benefit from its success are the ones who have a voice in how it develops. It is this model that the Canadian Internet Forum is based on. Your voice matters to us. And so as I said before the break, where do we go from here? We've heard many different perspectives today, and we want to make sure we've got every opportunity to have as many more, and so that we can summarize them into the report and share them with as many as stakeholders as possible. 
Some of the questions I've got. Is it enough that we held this event today? Or should we be do going, should we going, what should we be doing after CIRA has presented the findings of the Canadian Internet Forum to the Internet Governance Forum later in the year? What would you like to see going forward? We really want to hear from you now. What does the future hold? I'm looking for your points of view. This gentleman right here. And I've got some Syrah people if we need some comments in the background, but right now we just want to hear from you. All right, my, my comment, I think Byron Holland made a very important point. Syrah's job is to run the Canadian DNS, period. Okay. Having said that, CIRA is a nonprofit organization which is concerned with the utility and the health of the Canadian internet community. That's point number two. Point number three, CIRA is probably the, I'm going to say it anyway, CIRA is probably the one organization in Canada that has the legitimacy uh, to pull together a forum like this. Having said that, I would say the vast majority of the ideas and topics that came up here today are not specifically serious issues. And the one that was popped into my mind just before we went on break um, was the gentleman back here from the Inuit organization who pointed out, uh, and he basically he was addressing the issue of internet accessibility in the rural community. It's a big issue, but it's not serious problem. And, and so, I'm not sure how we're going to address that, but the fact that it's been brought up here is good, but let's not, let's not delude ourselves that CIRA is going to fix that problem. And I think we need to be very clear, what can CIRA do, what can CIRA highlight, and what can CIRA not do? Okay, so can I talk to you for a second about that? So um, if, if because CIRA brings people together, like all of you here today, and as a result of people get together, we talk, and important issues are raised, then CIRA is definitely playing an enabler role, but may not be the solution to everything that comes up. Exactly. Do you have a recommendation on what CIRA might do to bridge that? There are things that go beyond its mandate, but that come up because we create forums like this. Do you have a suggestion? No, not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the I comment, I, I, was, I wanted, after, when we went on break, and I apologize mm -hmm. for for uh, perhaps taking the gentleman on, on um, unexpectedly. But the gentleman brought up the idea of access to the internet in the rural community. Yeah. Um, I live in Ottawa. I've always lived in an urban environment. It's never been an issue. I have relatives in southern Manitoba with small children um, who are always faced with, how do I get my children onto the internet? And the only thing they could do uh, and I'm not going to mention the name of the company, but the only thing they could get was dial-up access uh, through their local telephone company, which was actually pretty spotty and pretty slow. What I discovered one of the times I went out to visit them was local initiatives. Somebody put together local wireless networks that were able to access all of the little farms in the area. Well, we heard from Robert, no better time for another startup. And that was, and, that, and my point is, it was a local initiative to do it, and it worked. Okay, thank you. And I think, this, did you have a question? Yeah, go to the front. I'll come back. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Pastian here in Ottawa. Uh, I just got the idea a few moments ago. I was staring at the .ca, and I'm thinking, I was going to ask the question, for instance, what could, uh, I think maybe the .ca could use a marketing so what, what would uh, something to kind of brand the .ca more in Canadians' minds as something to be proud of uh, owning a .ca and people doing business with a .ca domain? There are a lot of companies in Ottawa, in Ottawa and Canada who are uh, very well established that maybe tend to want to go with the .com only. But I, as I was thinking of that question in my mind. Here, you're going to like this because I do have a suggestion. Okay. And I thought maybe as far as a branding idea, because here's another thing too. There is a company called .ca or CA. It's very well known. So that's another thing. But that could be good for 
.ca. Now, the idea for a branding idea would be maybe instead of a dot in front of the CA, maybe a maple leaf or a maple leaf, or, or a, maple, a bright maple leaf inside the dot. Okay. Okay? Thanks. There we go. Thank you. Okay, thanks. A little marketing advice. We can always use some of that. It's this lady right here in the center. There's another gentleman. And if you're sitting in the back, I need you to move a little bit because it's almost impossible for me to see against the lights if you're back there. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Lorna Mata. Wanted to just talk, you asked about comments. Yeah. What's the vision for an ongoing um, CIRA or an ongoing CIF? I thought really you're demonstrating the, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think you're bringing people together. So you asked, is there a bridge role? I think that that's what you're doing. This morning they talked about the government role mm -hmm. and Industry Canada and they talked as well about the Internet Society, and then we have CIRA. And I think exactly what you're doing, I'd say keep on doing what you're doing. You did it the first time last year. I think that was a bit of a shock for everybody because, wow, we have CIRA here who wants us to participate. I think that was excellent. And now you've gone and done it a second time. So I think that's a great role. Okay. is bringing people together. I like that lady's suggestion about the survey. I think it would have been, and I guess she might be a marketing person, that maybe you had a kind of a captive audience here. So why not use us? <laughs> okay. So absolutely. So um, you, you are going to get a survey this time. So that's well, good. I, th I think that was a good idea because here we are. And obviously we're interested if we spend time here, although it was a really good offer. Um, you know, for, it was free, which is amazing these days, nothing's free. So I think, you know, as well, I think this morning they said Canada plays also a leadership role internationally and that we have a very secure internet. And I believe that Byron said it's, it's robust, it's, you know, not perfect, but that it's, it's very good in comparison to other places. So I think that naturally, then, we, we should take a leadership role. Okay. I don't know what Byron uh, thinks of that, but I, I see you're going there, and I'd say Just keep smiling. on doing what you're doing. Okay, thank you. All right. And, uh, you know, we can always use all of your help, too, right? You, you can become, the as Byron mentioned earlier, if you can be the emissaries of the message so that next, next year, come again, bring a friend. Okay, and tell, tell all of them. Gentleman in the red shirt. Thank you. Uh, my name is William Calls. It seems to me, it, and it's, it's stating the obvious, I guess, it, but the whole topic today is a moving target. So what we talked about today is not what we'll need to talk about next year. And that's the point, that this has to be an ongoing process. It, it can't stop once, we, once the presentation is made to the next uh, in the fall. That's not the end of it. It's, it's a, a check mark in a continuum, and we need to go on. And, the survey and so on that, that have been talked about are, are uh, good ways to continue. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment. And right here in the front, and then I'll be going back there. Here we come. We're going to give you two mics we think are so important. <laughs> Hi, Kim again. Um, okay, uh, yeah, um, actually, uh, excellent point about. Um, about this being an enabling kind mm -hmm. of a session. And um, also one other point, have you noticed that even though we, we're kind of male heavy in the room, all of a sudden the women have come out and started making comments? You mean non-dudes? The non-dudes. <laughs> the non-dudes, yeah, the non-dudes. Um, but if, uh, if Sira can continue in this enabling role, in, in part to define what the issues are and to see what they can handle, because that's part of the process, um, then how about going to the school boards uh, or going to the community learning centers, for example, in Quebec, um, where they are basically teleconferenced. There are several sites that are all teleconferenced there. Mm -hmm. um, offline, I can give you some contact information if you'd like that. Okay. And uh, basically, you can get several sites to all sit down at the same okay. time. Okay, thank you. I'm because, sure that's yeah, been, well, been noted. Yeah. And yes, right over there, there's two. Did I miss somebody? Okay. 
Yes, uh, yeah, my name is Wanda Hatko. Uh, I hope I am less, less nervous than the first time. <laughs> uh, yeah, so today was, was, in, was interesting for me during the morning panel discussion that the way we buy .ca domain matters. It, it's different if I buy my .ca from Tukals or from GoDaddy versus, let's say, CyberName which is Canadian company. I didn't know that. And I consider myself a little bit involved in the internet and coding. So this kind of message about the process of acquiring .ca, it should be maybe more visible to the public. That's the first comment. The second comment is uh, regarding the responsibilities that come with .ca. So we say, well, this kind of identifies us as Canadians. We want to be nice and high quality. So coming back, maybe there should be some set, not, I, I would hate to, to say enforced, you know, some mandatory, but kind of a normative list of responsibilities. So if you own .ca, website, please ensure that your HTML code, for example, is valid. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's a simple thing. Make the hackers working hard, harder to, to, uh, to hack your website. That's, that's basically my comment. Thank okay, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. And there was another gentleman just behind you. There's two there. Okay. Thank you. So, sorry. Okay. Yes, I have a vision for uh, an ongoing uh, CIF. Well, I was a bit surprised to see like today, uh, there was an occasion to create maybe an ephemeral social network uh, that was based on the event itself, helping people who were actually attending, um, getting in touch together or keeping the ability to um, communicate with each other after the event. So maybe th there's, there's something there to explore. I know I made a suggestion before coming here that you should set up uh, something on a, what's, what's called group site, groupsite.com, something that helps group site and subgroups to, uh, to discuss. But anyway, I'm, I'm sure that you have uh, many platforms and there's no, uh, no problem finding people who can assess what are the, the preferred platform for that. But maybe the, the, the essence of my comment is, relates to the uh, self-organizing nature of a social network. Mm -hmm. um, here we have uh, something that was defined as here are the issues, but I'm pretty sure that if you have a sufficient audience or a sufficient number of participants, at some point the network effect will, will create, uh, will keep the, the, the ball rolling on its own. It's going to have a life on its own. And uh, as a result, maybe one of the, the the possibility to explore is to create a public social network because we have many private social networks. Uh, maybe we find Facebook almost as a public uh, social network because it's so pervasive, but we forget that that's, that's a privately held uh, social network. But I'm pretty sure that there should be a space for a public social network uh, to discuss a uh, relation between uh, citizens and government. So maybe that, that's, that would be a, uh, an idea for Okay. Going so, forward, and I, so I assume you mean a pub, you know, a continuously running, maturing uh, public social network that just is born and stays alive over time. There was a gentleman to your right, I believe, with a question. Yes, uh, my name is Alex Perrier. I used to, um, I used to uh, be, a, um, sorry, I used to be a, um, a customer of Netfirms back when uh, their servers were in Markham, Ontario. So they're one of your uh, registrars that uh, register .ca domains. But I became really disappointed when uh, Netfirms, for whatever reason, decided to move their servers and launch new servers in Boston in the USA instead. So I was just, um, I just wanted to see, um, I don't know if it's the government or you, the, the CIRA that should do this, but I wanted to see more uh, protection and just uh, more choices for uh, Canadian registrars because I'm not too familiar with many and um, 
also host, so I'm, I don't really know which ones are out, out there. The only big ones I know are basically the telecoms like Bell, Telus, et cetera. So just wondering about that. Okay, thank you for that comment on registrars. Okay, there's one comment. It's a question, but I'm going to read it a little bit as a comment, if I can, from Dave online. It says, should CIRA promote training for digital literacy, uh, for example, at the community center level by providing standards or training materials? This question. Or should this really be done by others, and is it in the interest of ISPs to fund such activities? So I think uh, we're going to take that as a comment, Dave, uh, more than a question at the moment. But Bertrand? Um, thanks. Uh, I find it a little bit awkward to contribute to the question on the uh, Canadian ITF itself. But one, one idea is it is always extremely difficult to resist the pressure of doing good. And uh, as I was explaining for ICANN, CIRA is going to be exactly in the same situation because as an enabler of that kind of thing, the natural reaction is to say, why don't you do this, do this, and do that. The benefit of the self-organizing nature of the uh, internet environment is that those forums are just signposts. They are annual events, and they're what I call the watering holes where people come and talk about what they're doing elsewhere. And so the best way to have something that is ongoing is not for a Canadian internet forum to be permanent, but to make sure that there are initiatives that are running in between and take the annual event as an opportunity to, to come back. Right. And I take the opportunity to make one comment that came uh, for me uh, out of the discussion this morning and I never realized. One of the problems we'll be confronted with is that there's a generational problem. The generation that was basically, or that is now raised with Twitter, Facebook, and so on, will have a completely different mode of understanding of what policy making is. However, within authorities of policy, there's a generational issue, and I may have uh, white hair. Um, most of the people who are now in official positions are very much inside the uh, traditional model. And the challenge is that the problems are changing very quickly and people are going to exit this environment naturally but slowly, which means that the coming years are going to be a period of tension. Okay, thank you for that insight. There's a gentleman right here. Okay. Is anybody at the back waiting? Okay, gotcha. Hello, my name is Robert Stanley with uh, Blue Rabbit here in Ottawa. Um, two points. Um, one, addressing what we heard earlier, I think there is a clear need to create awareness of Canadian domiciled companies who provide the next level of service below domain name service. So the registrars, the web services, um, web serving hosting services. Would it be a consideration for CIRA to provide an outreach program that would produce a digital label to go, to be available to genuine Canadian providers of Canadian services, which would address the issue of uh, you know, Canadian companies that have moved their hosts into another legal jurisdiction such as the US or a Canadian company that turns out to be wholly owned by a foreign parent bringing the judicial, you know, the legislative issues uh, front and center. So I think that's something that CIRA could consider doing. Okay. Um, uh, for the rest, I've spent all my life being a futurist, and I think one of the things we are going to have to look at 10 years plus down the road is uh, the approach of what Raymond Kurzweil calls the singularity, the point where computers will have become capable of evolving themselves. The they will be so powerful and the programming so rich that we will have a new class of active entity on the internet. 25 years ago, Japan started something called the Fifth Generation Initiative, 
which was aimed at today to help what they perceived as an aging population emerging, who, which they would not be able to support fully with young people. There would be need for digital assistance. And out of this has come many things. Um, those of you who have new iPhones can talk to them using Siri, and Siri is, has a significant amount of intelligence in it. We are seeing more and more intelligent agents, and one of the possibilities for addressing technical literacy is simply to have an intelligent digital assistant who understands all of these issues and can grow as they change, because the key to what we call artificial intelligence is the ability to adapt dynamically to a changing world. But one of the things 10 years out we're going to have to look at is that the whole world of DNS will be different when there are really active, intelligent robot agents out there. We will need to have a more advanced robot protocol to discriminate between you know, the good and the bad robots. So just as something to think about, our future, even 10 years from now, has the potential to look incredibly different to the one that we're addressing today. But technology takes time to catch up, so we should start thinking about some of these issues. Thank you. Okay. So you're saying not only should we know if we're talking to a real authentic Canadian at a .ca registry, but we want to know whether it's a Canadian robot or not. <laughs> That's an interesting question when look at it, looking at the future. Uh, okay, and there was a lady just at the back in that corner, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I can't resist following up Robert's comment there by saying we shall all go back and read Bill Joy's article in Wired, I forget what year, but it was called Why the Future Doesn't Need Us Anymore. <laughs> uh, no, I just have a, a very, um, very practical comment about uh, I think that this forum could benefit from maybe one, maybe even two, but at least one small group session, like breakout session, mm -hmm. uh, so that you know you could you could use all the brains around the table to to talk about a certain issue and then bring it back. I mean, I, uh, sometimes there's a lot of people in the room who really haven't spoken on certain issues, so that's a way to give more people mm -hmm. a way to uh, participate. Okay, thank you for that. There's certainly some techniques that could be used there. Gentleman in the red shirt and the lady just beside. Hi, uh, Dylan Linegar. I um, wanted to comment a little bit on the point that was made about the mandate from CIRA. And I really think we value that neutral perspective and that rational point of view that you provide and it helps us understand these issues. As far as um, promoting, I think uh, maybe a proud to be.ca campaign would be good. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe we could do that. And for the event itself, there's usually like an information row where stakeholders can be part of the process, and I think we kind of miss that here. So maybe we can incorporate that in years to come. What do you mean by an information row? Where you'd have your stakeholders and other people who would be able to be informed on the subject. Um, our, some of our own organizations would be able to provide information resources and connect with mm -hmm. each other. Okay. I noticed one thing is a little bit different. Thank you for that. And I noticed one thing is just a little bit different about this year's uh, internet forum than last year's. Last year, I'd say about half of the people when they stood up to comment and stand up and said, hi, my name is uh, George and I'm a .ca owner. <laughs> and we were getting a lot of that, right? Uh, and yet today we, we didn't. So maybe we just need to reinforce that pride of the .ca ownership and in fact and stand up for Canadians as well. The lady just beside you, please. My name is Karen again, and I am a proud .ca owner. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Two quick points. I think as sort of an average Canadian who just sort of got online in a URL myself last year, um, I know I wanted to keep my money in Canada. I tried to sort of figure out how to do this and be a .ca and keep my money in Canada, and it wasn't easy. So I ended up being a GoDaddy girl. So I certainly agree with the other comments here as an average person. <laughs> If there was a lot more easy access to how I can keep my money in Canada and keep my support in Canada, why that's important, 
I learned right. a lot from being here today, and I'm sure many people would as well. Okay. I'm going to just, as my second point, reiterate, though, if we're going to be proud to be .ca, we've talked earlier today on the importance and the difference between .coms and .cas being, by definition, U.S. versus Canada, and we cannot, as Canadians, deny that over 40 million Americans do not have health care. And that is a major, major driver of most of the internet sites that come out of the dot-coms, and they are the leaders of marketing. You cannot tell the difference between for-profit and marketing and advertisement and real information. And as such, I think we have a responsibility to be leaders in this area as a .ca site that there should at least be guidelines or it should be an endorsement, whether it's a .ca level endorsement or even using the Switzerland guidelines, which are on codes, um, that if you have a .ca healthcare site, at least you should have a standard which we're hoping that you adhere to. Okay, thank you. That's pretty clear. Any other comments? Right here in the front. Hi, uh, my name is Tyler Bajan. I'm from dealershowcase.ca. Um, I'm finishing up at the University of Ottawa in a commerce degree, more particularly marketing, and I've been developing online digital properties for four years. And I find it hard to believe that the university doesn't get more involved with Sierra, uh, more involved particularly you know, with online development. Uh, my colleagues in marketing, I can count uh, more than my fingers that have .ca domains and are going to move on to working in online marketing. And I don't see any of them here. And, uh, and more to that, I don't see um, Sierra and the digital properties in our marketing classrooms. Uh, graduating in six weeks, uh, Kenwood right now is sponsoring a marketing class. Uh, so they're getting a lot of great ideas from inspiring people that are about to enter the world and you know, take part in this. And um, you know, perhaps Sierra should look at doing something like that and uh, working with the universities. Uh, after all, these are the people that are going to be able to take over these organizations. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, thank you. More ideas, lots of them. One more? Oh, right here. I am, um, it was just a general concept on the idea of getting things through. I think a lot of the things that don't happen or things that have seemed extreme recently with things that are trying to be made permanent in the internet has been fear. And I think that's because people don't understand stuff. And it needs to become common sense. And to make something common sense, it has to be something that everyone understands. And most of the knowledge that's being spread about the internet is on the internet. So the people who aren't hearing it are the people who are off the internet, and they're the people who need to be brought in. All the things to promote stuff for the internet is either for the people who are in school and obviously need to learn, or the elderly who are going to senior centers and being taught how to do this and those who need it for work. So the people who actually may need to be targeted more are the people who were out of school before the internet became very common and who aren't yet at that senior level. And they're the people who aren't hearing it. It's sort of like we take for granted a whole bunch of medical things that we've all been told all our lives and therefore it's common sense. You put cold on bruises because we all know it, so it's common sense. But I mean, once upon a time, it wasn't. Um, the internet needs to be promoted in that way where you're not just targeting the people who are using it, but targeting everybody. Okay, thank you. That whole digital, <clears throat> that issue comes up again and again. I think we heard the aspect of digital literacy expressed in so many different ways today, the need to start in the schools and also to particularly address the need for the elderly as well, both ends of the spectrum. One more over here. Okay. Hi, I'm Julie Mar oh, sorry. I'm Julie Marion and I created an Ever Evergreen Paste. And what I do is I go directly into a forest, I take all my ingredients there and I turn trees into this paste. And I've been living in a forest for a very long time, so I'm really not digitally inclined. And I did get a dot C A and I'm really happy about it. And I did not know who Sierra was. I'm really sorry. <laughs> and I, I did get the survey, and I had no idea, went into my spam, so I just left it there. But then I did the Twitter thing, so I'm trying to modern on, 
modernize myself. So then I saw Robert Herjavec was going to be here, and then I saw Sierra, and then that's how I kind of figured out who it was. But anyhow, my question and comment is, because she was saying about the, uh, the people who don't have access to the internet, like the, the grandmothers or the stay-at-home moms mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I'm kind of one of them because I was in a bush mm -hmm. and, and I've created this stuff and I have clients all over the world and it's all done through word of mouth. I didn't go onto the internet until November and I've had clients since 2004 and they're international clients and because they were bugging me to go on the internet so they could buy stuff and get more information, that's why I did it. Now, how do I, as a clueless person, because I really don't know the internet, I'm tr trying to build it, and I don't know how, and how do I know the proper guidelines, what are the rules, and how do I know to protect myself as a mm -hmm. new person? Okay. Like, so, thank you. So, you need to be able to know exactly where to go to find all of that information. <laughs> some of it, some of it's there, and we note that you need to know more easily where it is. I don't have the answer to your question, but <laughs> there you go. See, networking works every time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, and appreciate that. One last comment. Or are we good? There we go, sir. Take it home. Okay, thank you. I, well, I, I would just uh, maybe um, read an excerpt from a, from a book, actually, and I think it's a good uh, closing statement. Uh, it's, it's a book from uh, Clay Shirky called Here Comes Everybody, and it talks about the difference between collective action and protest. We saw today that um, collectivities were successful in protesting and preventing things from happening, but making things happening is much more difficult collectively. So that, that's just an excerpt. Perhaps collective action is more focused on protesting than creating because collective action is simply harder than sharing or collaborating. As a result, collective action requires a much higher commitment to the group and the group's shared goal than things like sharing of picture within collaborative creation of software. Even given this difficulty though, we have examples of people coming together and engaging in collective action that in both long-term and creative. The canonical example is a barn raising where members of a farming village all turn out to help a neighbor build a new barn, often raised in a single day. A barn raising requires a group. 30 people can raise a barn in a day, but one person can't build the same barn in a month. Barns need groups to do the assembling. Like open source software and wikis, barn raisings don't involve commercial transaction, and yet they happen. Thank you for that inspirational conclusion comment. Well, thank you all for your active participation throughout the day. It was certainly the intention to give you information and to receive your points of view and comments, and I believe you've certainly done that by expanding on everything that you were given with your own points of view throughout the day.